It was in New York City at Carnegie Hall on November 14, 1943, that Leonard Bernstein burst onto the music scene. At the age of 25, he had just been appointed assistant conductor of the New York Philharmonic. The point of that job was to be always ready to jump in in case a conductor, a real conductor of the Philharmonic, that is, Rajinsky, or a guest conductor, got ill. But within the memory of anybody at the Philharmonic, no conductor had ever gotten sick. And all the assistant conductors here had just sat, growing increasingly bitter, frustrated, uh, knowing that all the scores, being always ready, having their tails coat hanging in the locker backstage, ready to come on at a moment's notice, uh, and never getting the opportunity to do so. And I had not been in, uh, in this job uh, two months. It was November 14th, 1943, I will never forget. That Sunday morning at nine o'clock, the phone rang, and it was Bruno Zerato on the other end saying, well, this is it. You have to conduct at three o'clock this afternoon. No chance for a rehearsal, nothing. Bruno Walter is ill, he has the flu. There's no way to get the orchestra together. And you will report at quarter of three backstage at Carnegie Hall and conduct the concert this afternoon. So there I am standing in the wings, all a tremble, listening to Bruno Zerato, who had come out on stage, address the audience and tell them the unhappy news that they would not be hearing Bruno Walter that day, many groans, but instead would be hearing a young a conductor called Leonard Bernstein. And that's the last thing I remember until the end of the concert when I saw the entire audience there standing and cheering and screaming. But between the time of my entrance and the time of my last exit, I remember nothing. The next thing I remember is my mother and father and my mother and father walking into the dressing room and my father all aglow. It was the first time in his life and baffled. He couldn't understand what had happened because he had been so against my being a musician all those years. Where will it lead you to playing in a hotel lobby for the rest of your life and a, with palm That's trees it. and playing Cole Porter songs. With the, you see, his tradition Perfect. was uh, that a musician in the Russian Jewish ghetto, where he came from, after all, till he was 16, he lived in such a ghetto. A musician was among the lowest orders of, of being. A musician was a strolling right. player who went from wedding to wedding or funerals and bar, bar mitzvahs or whatever playing his violin or whatever he played and was thrown a kopeck now and then or given a bowl of soup to eat. But he was little better than a beggar. Watch for it. It was a very low order of humankind. And it was very hard for him to adjust to the fact that there was such a thing as a musical world in which one could succeed. And they cut off and he says, I want to pray. <laughs> Uh, I was short. Um, I didn't even know as a child, I think till I was 14, that there were such things as concerts that one could go to. That uh, there was such a thing as a musical life. That there were musicians, there was a community of musicians. That there were music lovers, that there were people who took it all very seriously. I had no background at all in music from my family. And here was my father standing there absolutely dazzled, bewildered, stupefied, because he had seen, how many thousands of people does this place hold, on their feet screaming and cheering for his little Lenny who had been standing there conducting all afternoon. And he suddenly realized that it was all possible. And. Uh, there was a great moment of forgiveness and very deep emotion. Leonard Bernstein was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts in 1918. 
His parents were immigrants from Russia. His father hoped his son would join the family business. He said years later, how was I to know he would grow up to be Leonard Bernstein? After the historic debut at Carnegie Hall, Leonard Bernstein's rise to fame was nothing short of phenomenal. He became an instant celebrity. Fame brought almost limitless opportunities for his creative energies. A curious corollary occurs to me sitting here in Carnegie Hall, but as a corollary to the event, the great event that took, here, took place here in 1943. And that is that it was not just a concert for the 2,000-odd people in this hall, but it was a radio broadcast. And I've said this before, but it occurs to me in an interesting new light because it was kind of prophetic that my debut as a conductor should have been involved with the electronic medium. Uh, the medium of radio because that was to play in its various other manifestations such a great part in the rest of my life since that day. But it wasn't really until 1954 when I got involved with television that I realized what the tremendous power of the media can be in terms of music. Leonard Bernstein was an immediate success on television. His special combination of intelligence and wit ensured his reputation as music's most articulate spokesman. Well, you see, they don't need me. They do perfectly well by themselves. So why is a conductor necessary, after all? But what I realized about it was not only could I share what I thought and felt about these matters, about Beethoven and about the creative process itself with millions of people face to face, eye to eye, nose to nose, but that I could also use visual aids, which was a whole new wrinkle. Uh, for example, we had the first page of the Beethoven Fifth, the whole score, painted in white on a black floor, and we had musicians standing, each one on the designated line. There was a viola player on the viola line, a clarinet player on the clarinet, and so on. And then I dismissed the ones that Beethoven had dismissed in his own mind, because he begins the Fifth Symphony only with strings and clarinets. So out went flutes, oboes, horns, trumpets, and leaving only the people who were relevant standing there. And this made such an impression on people, because it had this visual connotation and corroboration of what I was saying, which they were receiving in an auditory way, I realized suddenly that my old teaching instinct, which I had inherited from my father and from all my teachers, I guess, who taught me how to teach, this old quasi-rabbinical instinct that I have for teaching and explaining and verbalizing, uh, suddenly found a real paradise in the whole electronic world of television.